Attention, attention. You are listening to a pre recorded episode of The Curious Realm. Curious Realm is busy traveling the vast void of time and space to find the best paradigm changing content the universe has to offer. Enjoy the following transmission and remember stay curious. Stay curious. Coming to you from the city of the weird. Exploring topics from the esoteric and unexplored to dimensions unknown. Shining a light of truth on the darkest corners of our reality. Welcome to the Curious Realm. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this very, very special edition of the Curious Realm podcast. It is not often that we we go into prophecy. Every once in a while, we will discuss the concept of end-time prophecies. Uh, every once in a while, we have discussed um, things that are happening in the Ukraine, stuff like that, and how they relate to end-time prophecies. But we have never done an actual episode on it. I think that now is really the time. There, There is so much going on in the world around us, especially when we look at what is actively happening right now in the Middle East, in Israel, Palestine. Um, we'll, we will be getting into that part and how the modern political action and war going on in that area relates to the biblical prophecies that relate to the area and relate to now. Uh, but I would like to bring on our good friend, uh, Ella LeBain. Ella LeBain, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Oh, doing good. Thank you for having me back. It's always good to talk to you, Chris. Same, same. I always love having you on because you, you actively for years studied Hebrew, um, things like that. And it, it really does bring a, a different texture to the conversation of end time prophecy whenever you were talking about specifically Ezekiel, Daniel, things like that, uh, to fully understand the Hebrew tradition behind these things and the Hebrew teaching behind them. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on and discuss this very important topic, Ella. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure, Chris. Well, um, let let's start off because a lot of people i mean i would i would venture to say most people whenever they hear the term end time um are thinking book of revelation yes. you know the, the 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 apocalypse of of john uh things like that um not many people i get most people who've dug into the bible who've read the bible who understand biblical history know that many of the references made in that come from the book of Daniel, come from the books of Ezekiel, um, come from previous Hebrew texts, and are leaned on heavily, um, showing the the coming apocalypse to the people of Rome um, who were who were going through the persecution, things like that. So <laughs> let let's really start getting into Ezekiel and the book of Daniel and how that relates to biblical prophecy and prophecy of the end times, Ella. Yes. Well, uh, those are all uh, good topics. And um, just want to say that the Old Testament, uh, the books of the prophets contain all the prophecies about Israel and about the end times. Um, and just for definition purposes, I would li like to just underscore that Please. what what we mean when we say end times prophecy is this was a phrase that was coined uh, when Israel became a, a modern uh, yes. a 
Western state, which was yeah. in 1948. So that really began the beginning of end time prophecy uh, countdown because of what was uh, prophesied in the book of Ezekiel chapter 37. So, so chapter 37, and I'm sure everybody you know, is familiar with this because, you know, there was like a song about it, you know, in kindergarten about uh, the, the dry bones, you know, this bone is connected to that bone, that kind of thing, remember? But that that song came out of that uh, chapter, which is uh, when the Lord uh, basically tells Ezekiel to prophesy over the dead Israelites whose bones were dried up in the land of Israel. And uh, that he, he basically said that he was going to um, bring breath back into those bones, put flesh on those bones, and put his spirit back into those bones and those bones would live again and they would rise up to be a great army. And um, this essentially is the chapter that not only uh, prophesies about the rebirth of the nation of Israel, but it also <laughs> proves reincarnation in the Bible. Mm. Oh, I said that word. So, uh, <laughs> trigger. So, um, so many Christians have problems with that because they're taught otherwise. What? They're they've been taught, and this goes back, and I write about this where it began. This this implant, this you know that 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 makes them believe that reincarnation wasn't God's plan when it was, and it was all throughout. Yeah. Ancient Judaism that that and, it was it was a it was an understood fact in yes. ancient Judaism to the fact I mean that is where sins of the fathers comes in yes is the fact of you you may be reincarnated back into your familial line yes that is exactly which is a very common belief in Orthodox Judaism uh, exactly that and this is the reason why in that Jews traditionally will name their children the first letter yep. of whomever last died in the family because of the belief that the soul would live through the ancestral line and be reborn into the family and you know like just like in Fiddler on the Roof when they were saying oh why do they do this tradition and the, there's always a reason behind the tradition and that is the reason and I'm not gonna uh, lie Ella there's a reason why my son has my grandfather's name there you go Yes. So you see, and you don't have to be Jewish to uh, practice that because no. it, it's an old, it's a very ancient belief. Yeah. And I find so many Christians are so, um, you know, blinded by this. Oh, where absolutely. They think, they think that reincarnation comes from Hinduism. And, and let me just say that back in ancient times, the uh, the, the, you know, the Indus River, everything all came out of Mesopotamia. Um, the, you know, Sanskrit and Hebrew are two of the oldest earth languages. And both groups were living on the planet at the same time, which is why they held similar beliefs. Mm. Okay. Yeah. About, about rebirth, that is. Not necessarily like one was monotheistic and the other is polytheistic. So that's a very, you know, big distinction in terms of ancient religious beliefs. But, re you know, so, you know, Ezekiel 37 clearly describes the rebirth, the reincarnation yeah. of ancient Israel. And um, this is a key piece in understanding end time prophecy because of what it says um, in uh, the book of Obadiah and as well as the book of Revelation, where uh, there, there's a prophecy and in Daniel. Sorry, Daniel, mm -hmm. where it says that 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 they will look upon those whom they pierced and they will mourn 
okay, as they see the Son of Man coming in the sky. Now, how is that possible? Okay, because first of all, uh, you know, we're, we're close, but we're not there at the second coming yet. And all those people, the piercing is another, is a biblical vernacular for crucifixion. So, so all those people who were involved in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to over 2,000 years ago died. They're, they've been dead and buried a long time. So how, there's only one answer, okay, that, that they can look upon those whom, that, whom they pierced when he returns is that they're on the earth again at that time because they've been reborn. They've been reincarnated yeah. so that they can have another chance Okay, because it's God's grace to give, you know, chances, extra chances. Absolutely. And, you know, it, it, it's 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 within the mercy seat of the Lord as to how many chances somebody gets. Well, I mean, and, you're a parent, you know how how it is with children. And, you know, they will be unending the right. chances. So Ella, with, and, when you when you love your son, you love your daughter, you're going to give them as many chances as it takes to get it right. Well, and two things to remember. Number one, that we as Christians tend to put our Christianity upon. Many people forget the fact that in Hebrew tradition, there is no heaven, there is no hell. There is Sheol. Yes. Everybody goes to Sheol until the time of judgment. Good, bad, doesn't matter. Everybody goes to the same place until the time of final judgment. And the fact that, secondly, that, that I am going to make breath enter you and you will live. That once again, I, I've, I've spoken and we've spoken about it whenever I've had you on the show before. Um, that goes straight to the heart of Jewish teaching and to the heart of Jewish Kabbalistic teaching and the idea of we create because we have the breath of God inside of us, because yes. we alone were the ones breathed spirit into. Yes. And because of this, these bones once again have that chance right. to create, to, to be full once again. So it's really interesting to see that concept of full reincarnation being used um when you're talking about end time prophecy yes and it, it is it is rife and i pull all these scriptures out and connect the dots in my book to prove this and um because this is a, a blind spot in modern christianity and and i um uncovered why? So I found the the history of of when they edited the Bible, mm -hmm. and it all goes back to these two Roman creeds. Okay, Constantine's Creed of 325 A.D., which really began uh, the official ch uh, Roman Church doctrines of replacement theology and anti-Semitism, yeah. and and the war that they basically waged on the God of Israel. Because like uh, Constantine's Creed basically says that if anyone uh, practices the feasts, the Jewish feasts, where they're actually the feasts of the Lord, they will be anathem anathema to Rome. Yeah. And if they uh, practiced the, the Sabbath on, on a Saturday and not a Sunday, they were considered anathema to Rome and Judaizers if they refused to eat unclean meat, same thing. So that became the church doctrines of anti-Semitism and where they tried to strip the Jewish roots out of Jesus. They tried to strip, his, you know, because he was Jewish. I mean, he came from the tribe of Judah, which is where we get the word Jew from. Absolutely. It's Yehuda, because there's no J in the Hebrew language. Yep. So it, they were called, Ye, you know, Yehudim. And, and then, you know, in English, basically after the 1700s, the J was um, in, introduced. And I mean, even the first King James Bible of 1611 didn't have the name Jesus in it. Yep. Uh, 
was his Latin and Greek name, which was Iesus. So mm -hmm. they basically switched the I for the J. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's the English transliteration of Yeshua, which is what's his Hebrew name, yeah. which means salvation. So, um, you know, so so basically the history of, of how they put the Bible together was um, uh, governed by Rome. And, you know, here in America, we take for granted that we have this separation between church and state because we don't actually have a theocracy. Absolutely. But in Rome, everything, the, 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 their politics and their religion were one. And when they decreed anything, whether it was religious or political, it was all the same. So this was a, a Roman governing decree, which has become a spell in, in the true sense of the word, because... Mm -hmm people continue to live under it and they don't realize that it's a curse. So this is this is the stuff that I unpack in my books because I'm trying to help people to get free so that they can, you know, open their eyes and see the truth. So that's number 1. Number 2 was the Nicene creeds and that yeah. came uh uh, a little later, because it, the seven ecumenical councils were editing the Bible. And so I found a, a story, that, which I published in um, my fourth book, Covenants, that basically tells the reason that they were motivated to get the monks, who were the scribes editing the Bible, to, to delete as much as they could, but, you know, to err is human, and they weren't perfect all the scriptures that have to do with reincarnation out of the Bible because they did not want uh, people to believe in it. They wanted people to believe that you either get your life right now with the Church of Rome or you're going to hell. Like there was yeah. no... No, was, it, it was a black and white doctrine, absolutely. Yes. And in even now, in a lot of ways, it's still very much a black and white doctrine. And... Um, so when people yeah. see the history of how and why this was uh, manipulated and orchestrated, um, then you can see that, you know, it's it's created another false belief system, which has actually blinded a lot of modern day Christians who really want to serve the Lord, who really want to understand end time prophecy, but they're, um, they're blocked and they're blinded because they don't believe that God reincarnates people, yeah. but they believe that Jesus was resurrected. They believe in the yeah, resurrection. Yeah. yeah. So it really is not much of a difference because it's not something, it's not a religion. Let me just point that out. People think, oh, reincarnation is religious. It's not. Yeah. It's a it's a core belief system that it, that that is held within Judaism and all the world's religions except for Christianity because they were told not to believe it. So um, it 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 basically. Uh, underscores and highlights many of these end time prophecies and 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 by not being able to understand that this was a core Jewish belief they can That's never right. understand how these end time prophecies were going to unfold so for instance i mean israel the land of israel was in a drought for 1800 years nothing grew there it was cursed okay so there were the, after the second diaspora after you know rome destroyed the second temple and all the uh, the israelites and the jews and all the tribes had to disperse and leave and they moved all around the planet and i sort of traced the lost tribes in my fourth book covenants because there was evidence of them all over the place uh, you know they 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 went to africa they went to europe there was evidence of them in afghanistan and even in japan there there are jewish temples and then i found evidence here in america through the uh, native american cherokee tribe who kept the oral traditions of the name of the of who they call great spirit and they are the only native american tribe that had this word and had this name because they preserved it 
you know, orally, uh, and they kept, just kept it going. And, and that is the correct pronunciation of the God of Israel, which is Yahuwah. So, you know, people call him Yahweh just because of, you know, language and mm -hmm. how language got watered down. Jehovah was a made up name after what that Rome actually did because of the, um, the the letter J, which has actually, I prove in my second book, become a, 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 another entity. Yeah. Okay. The actual so, name of God would have been spelled uh, Y H V H. There, yes, there, they, there would be zero vowels whatsoever. Right. No vowels, and that's another piece that I found in the history was the Masoretic Jews, because they were uh, held captive in Babylon for seventy years. Yep. They had to listen to the Enuma Elish every day, and so they decided this was like their whole thing was to protect the sacred name of the Lord. So they didn't want the Gentiles to misuse it. So they did this deliberately. Okay. When they, okay. So they mm. took, as you said, the, the ancient Hebrew didn't have vowels in it. Okay. So when they, they rewrote the Torah, the whole old Testament, and they put vowels on all the words, okay, to help people to read it. But when it came to the name of the God of Israel, which is written 7,000 times through the old Testament, yep. they covered it up deliberately to confuse the Gentiles. And they succeeded in doing that. And they put the, the the vowels that comes from Adonai and Elohim under the yud He vav He, the te which is also called the Tetragrammaton, so that when people read it, it wouldn't read uh, correctly because they didn't want people to say his name in vain. So I pulled all these scriptures out, about 35, 33, 35 of them in the Old Testament that actually commands the uh, ancient Israelites to say the, his name, to sing his name, to thank, to praise, to memorialize his name, all these things, to exalt his name. And, and, and there was a curse that was brought down on the the high priests because they stopped esteeming the 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 holy name of the god of israel and then this came and then what came out of it they were so afraid of the curse and all this horrible stuff that happened to them so the masoretic jews decided we're going to just protect it cover it up and confuse everybody and they did okay so this is history astoundingly so, well yeah yeah so now you have all these extra names and there's all this kind of conflation because yes, the, the Old Testament, the book of Genesis specifically, is a, a, a continuation of the Sumerian tale, the Sumerian history, uh, the Enuma Elish. And, and the this... conglomeration. It's yes. A, it's a, uh, that, and we just brought that up uh, the other day because it, it, it states it right there. Like first story of creation, second story of creation, like yes, and they, and this they is, are labeled such, and they yes. are different. <laughs> yes. Mankind comes along at a different point. Mankind yes. is created in a different way. One is Sumerian, one is Babylonian. It depends, and and that's just it. the The Jewish people, um, this wasn't written as time went along. You know that this was written after they became a people. After they had spent as a tribe, as one tribe slave over here, another tribe slave over here, learning different ways. Yes, and and there was so much movement around in the ancient world, and and also then of course the floods, mm. okay, which which wiped everybody's memory, and they had to kind of start all over again. And so when you see that the people in uh, the genealogy in the uh, book of Genesis, in the in the early uh, part of the Bible, they lived 960 years. I mean, Methuselah yeah. lived nine, but then after the after Noah's flood, nobody lived more than a hundred or or 120. So so there was a definite 
genetic manipulation to Homo sapiens sapiens from that happened after Noah's or during Noah's flood. So this is the stuff that I studied with uh, Zachariah Sitchin's material because, you know, like a lot of people have gotten... Um, you know, taking stuff out of context and sort of ran with it and, cr and create this whole like other belief system that the Anunnaki created humankind. So what I prove in my uh, books is that, yes, in fact, the Anunnaki genetically manipulated humankind, but they didn't create humans because the humans were already on the earth when they came. So, yeah. so a lot of people have this sort of myopic viewpoint and they think, okay, because the Bible is 6,000 years old, then humans must be 6,000 years old. But you know, that, that is not the case. So, so the, the book of Je Genesis 1, 1 actually starts after the first flood. Okay, which was the sinking of the civilizations of Atlantis and Lemuria, which in Dake's Bible, he calls that Lucifer's flood. And this is significant in identifying mm. who is the God of this world. Okay, and the Bible is very clear, today's Bible, and even the New Testament is very clear that that Satan is the God of this world. I mean, Jesus even acknowledged that. Okay. So, and who is in my whole, um, work is to, you know, figure out who, who are these, this, this whole cast of characters in the old, who is Satan? Well, Satan is just a Hebrew word that means adversary or rebel. Okay. So that's why in, in my books, I, make it plural because there's more than one. Okay. And yes, there's, there is definitely like, you know, like a head and uh, like the head of the snake, so to speak. And, and Lucifer is definitely involved in that, but here's what happened with the church of Rome and how they have, and this mm. is significant and important to understanding what's happening now. So the church of Rome um, had Jerome, who they call now St. Jerome, yeah. uh, was commissioned by the Pope to rewrite the Old Testament in Latin. So he was the first one to do that. So when he got, and you know, these translations are only as good as the people who are translate, if they understand the original language, to translate it. And because we know that there were several manipulations, like even the Masoretic Jews, they deliberately flipped the the vowels yeah. to confuse. So who's to say that, that, that they didn't do this in the Latin? And so this is what I found. So in Isaiah 4, chapter 14, which is the only place in the entire Old Testament that this word shows up, and this is the chapter where the Lord is basically rebuking the 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 being who rebelled against him okay and uh he doesn't call him satan he calls him halal and halal is an antonym for hallelu so it's like the opposite of hallelu so hallelu means to praise which is where mm -hmm. we get the word hallelujah which is to sure. praise yahuwah you know and and hebrew is also uh you know famous for truncating and and uh you know like nicknames shorthanding shortening things right so yah is short for yahuwah um so hallelujah came from hallelu but ha halal is the opposite and it literally translates to he who boasts in a foolish rage and that's what he called this individual who i am kind of you know um connecting is, is to the Sumerian Marduk. Okay, so um, and and Marduk is mentioned in the Old Testament once as the king of Babylon, and he was not only the king of Babylon he, in the ancient Sumerian text, he was also known as the Lord of Nibiru, and that's where we get the word Mars from, from him, and he went to Mars, and he was in Babylon, mm. and he 
wanted to lay claim to the earth as well. So when you look at the Sumerian tale about who he was and where he came from, he was the son of Enlil and the nephew of Enkai. And he challenged both of them. He challenged his father and he challenged his uncle, who both got murdered, okay? And Enlil ends up in the middle of the earth, okay, inside the earth, um, because of his rape, all right? So, so I connect linguistically these ancient names to, uh, to uh, Allah, okay? So Enlil ends up becoming, Allah has 99 names, but he, that's one of them. So, so what did, so back to Jerome. So what did Jerome do in Isaiah 14? How did he translate Isaiah 14, where the Lord said the five I wills, when he says, I will ascend above the most high. And then he calls him, you know, uh, Halel, the, 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 the son of the morning, the, the, the morning star. He puts that word, okay, and he gives the word Lucifer, which in Latin means light bearer, okay, yes. or light worker. So, so Lucifer in and of itself is not a, a, a bad name, no. but it is who this being is. So he, instead of uh, uh, translating it, you know, accurately, like this is a dark being that fell from heaven, that is a rebel of, of the most high God, and he's been rebuked like multiple times. He's now elevated him to a Christ figure. And, and it blows, it, it blows my mind, and I'm sure it'll blow other people's minds, especially if you're deep into Catholicism, that today's uh, Vatican, you know, first of all, the word Vatican means divining serpent, that they actually worship Lucifer, okay? They invoke him during their mass. And you can listen to this on their YouTube channel. This is not a secret. It, it, it's not done behind closed doors. It's done, but most people don't understand Latin. So when they go and they listen to these masses and they're like, well, what did he just say? Like, unless you're really listening and following, they, they believe that Lucifer is Christ. Okay. So, so, you know, this is so, this whole religious piece is, is, is complex, but if you start to, like what I've done is just like, where do these pieces come from? And, and how we ended up today, where today's Vatican has now created a new uh, sect or new religious group called Chrislam, because they have uh, invited the Muslims to pray at the Vatican, and they do, they do their daily prayers at mm -hmm. the Vatican, and they are calling it Chrislam because today's Pope is is leading this movement uh, to create a one world religion. So, so back to the Jewish uh, prophecies, the end yes. time prophecies that literally name who this this end time alliance and coalition is. So what we have in the book of Daniel, Jesus talked about the book of Daniel. Yeah. Um and he 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 promoted it. He loved it because he believed it because you know it was the it was it was happening. So um Daniel talks about these four empires and we know that um you know, there there was the, the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, and then the iron and the clay, which is kind of the hybrid, which is where we're at right now. This is the end times, the iron and the, and the yes, clay. The statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream is what you're talking about. Yes, correct. And so the gold is the Babylonian Empire, which was basically around 600 BC. The silver was uh, the Me Media Persian Empire, which is significant because Persia is today's Iran. Mm -hmm. And then the bronze was the Greek Empire around 330 BC. And then the iron represents the Roman Empire, which was around 27 BC. And um, basically fell because of Christianity. And then you have the iron and the clay, which is basically the Roman Empire um, part two. So mm -hmm. what 
Daniel talks about is a revived Roman Empire. So when you look at the map and you see, well, where was the Roman Empire and where they ruled over all these uh, countries um, that have now become Muslim? And this is very significant to understand the end time prophecy that all these uh, nations that are named by their ancient names, and some of them still have the same name, they're all Muslim. Okay, so the revived Roman Empire rules over or somehow is connected to it, it, this coalition of Islam. And what's happening in the Islamic world is that they're 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 fighting amongst themselves. I mean, we, we we've been hearing about the uh, division between the Sunni and the Shias for years. Right. Um, and, and this is why Iran uh, is uh, arch enemies with uh, Saudi Arabia, because the, uh, the Saudis um practice a different kind of um different branch of islam yes and they're not they're not jihadists the 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 uh iranians and the turks they're they're go they're moving into that jihadi and they believe that every the whole world should be muslim okay so so when we look at the book of revelation and we see that in the end times, people are going to be beheaded by the Antichrist. And was like, well, who does beheadings anymore? The Muslims. The Muslims are still doing beheadings. No other religion on earth practices beheadings. Okay. And then we see words like barbarian and Scythians. Okay. Which the Scythians, uh, the ancient Scythians, uh, actually, we're in the geographical location of what would be considered today's southern Iran. Okay, and 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 the the scripture calls them barbarians because because even the Roman Empire was scared of them that they were so intense, they were so strong, and they did such horrible things. So what are we seeing on the planet today? Well, you know, uh, it, you know, ISIS, the, you know, uh, Muslim Jihad, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, it's all, uh, you know, the same uh, 10 headed dragon. And when when we see the scriptures that talk about the 10 horns, and for years, um, Christian eschatologists um, uh, surmise or you know, hypothesize that those ten horn horns represent power. So they were, you know, like like nations of power. They thought it was Europe, okay. But I have connected dots, and I am saying that it's the Muslim nations, okay, that they are the the ten heads of the same dragon. So you have. Um, you have, uh, so Edom, okay, uh, like in Obadiah, this prophecy is that the Lord is going to punish Edom, and Edom is today's Palestine, Palestine, Jordan area. Um, he says, I will destroy uh, their clever men wipe out their wisdom fighting men of Timon, which Timon is today's Yemen, which is also one of the uh, radical Muslim nations. Um, and also uh, he, he talks about um, how uh, that you stood aside on the day when the enemies broke down Israel's gates. Um, you know, he's basically pulling up the past and saying, you know, and this is the thing about the past, is that the past is prologue. And we cannot understand the future unless we really have a grasp on what happened in our history. Yes, 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 absolutely. And, uh, you know, um, it's funny that we come to this point of this conversation at this point, because I wanted to divide this between the history of what we're talking about and how the history of what we're talking about applies to what's happening right now in the news and in the world. And this is a perfect time for mm -hmm. us to take that break, let everybody kind of digest what they've heard for the first 
40 minutes here. Um, and when we come back from commercial break, folks, we will get into end time prophecy, how it relates to what is currently happening in the world around us. Uh, the way that Ella has broken it down is pretty eloquent here. Um, and we'll be getting into, uh, of course, the, the idea of prophecy being changeable. Don't forget there, there's always an out with actual prophecy folks. So we will, we will talk about these things when we come back from this commercial break. With the rise in attention to the health benefits of cannabis and cannabinoids, including CBD, True Hemp Science has become one of the premier providers of full-spectrum CBD and CBD-related products. Using a proprietary spigeric process, True Hemp Science extracts maximum benefit from the whole hemp plant. Buds, leaves, stems, seeds, even roots. Every part of the plant is used and then reused to formulate a rich, complex profile of CBD, CBD derivatives, and terpenes guaranteed to provide the relief and benefits you need daily. Visit TrueHempScience.com to experience the best CBD oils, edibles, and topicals on the market today. And use code CURIOUS7 to save 7% off your entire purchase of $50 or more and get two 25 milligram CBD cookies or brownies free. That website again is truehimscience.com and the code is curious7. Have you considered starting a podcast, looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one -on -one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies, Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today. And let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultational workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast related on the internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training. And use code CURIOUS20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website again is podcastcadet.com. Curious Realm Podcast is your source for the latest and greatest news and events in the world of the paranormal, esoteric, and forbidden knowledge. 
And there's no better way to spark the conversation than with items from the Curious Realm store. Choose from fan favorites like hoodies, mouse pads, coffee mugs, and more. Buy books and items from your favorite Curious Realm guests. Get your hands on the latest gear for paranormal investigations and experiments we discuss on the show. Open your web browser and stop on by the Curious Realm store at CuriousRealm.com forward slash store to buy the latest Curious Realm wear and out of this world gifts for yourself, your family, or a mind that you want to open. That website again is CuriousRealm.com forward slash store thank you so much to all of our sponsors out there especially true him science true him science is my brand of cbd uh, i found christopher lynch many years ago after my doctor prescribed me cbd for my travel use uh for my anxiety and i searched long and hard all over the country i found chris at a farmer's market here in Austin, Texas, and his stuff is incredible, folks. Uh, he has the best product out there, hands down. Stop by, check them out. TrueHimScience.com is the website. They use a full spigeric process. Everything is done alchemically. Awesome. Actual terpene profiles, different stuff for each different blend that they have. TrueHimScience.com is the website. Curious 7 is the code that you want to use to save 7% off your entire cart of $50 or more and get two free edibles. Uh, welcome back, Ella. Let's let's start getting into um, the document that you sent me, which which kind of lays out as as we were getting into just before commercial break, the uh, overlaying what is happening right now in the world with biblical prophecy, end time prophecy, according to Hebrew tradition. Yes. Well, hi, uh, thanks for having me back. Um, so, you know, uh, I'm all about who, who are the cast of characters? Who are these, um, names that were named in the ancient texts? Um, some of them have changed. Uh, but they're still the same grouping of people, of tribes, of nations, and geography. Um, so, you know, what, what's just happened when uh, Hamas attacked Israel in, in a, a cruel, uh, horrible, unprecedented way, we are, are seeing that, that this is not an isolated incident. OK, and the, it is the first time that that has happened in Israel. I mean, they've had four wars already since Israel became a state and everyone is comparing what happened uh, October 7th to uh, what happened on the Yom Kippur War in 1973 because it they were taken by surprise. Um, so so that's a, a similarity there. But this, you know, a lot of people think that this is a war between Israel and Hamas, and that is not accurate. This this is a war, and this is the net. This is this is part of the end, the beginning of the end times war, World War Three, that is between uh, the um, the jihad, the Muslim nations, the Muslim alliance coalition. Okay, and we can name all of them because they're all named in uh, Obadiah and Ezekiel and uh, the the um, the Old Testament uh, of this whole coalition, which includes Iran. Today's Iran is ancient Persia, and the barbarians. The Bible actually uses the word barbarians and Scythians, which used to be uh, in this area, which was in around southern Iran. So, um, what were they all going for? And this is the, my first book, uh, book one, talks about this ancient space portal, which we call today Jerusalem. Okay, so Jerusalem, why are they all fighting? Or why have they been fighting over Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem belongs 
to the God of Israel. And it's an ancient space portal that Zachariah Sitchin proved through the Sumerian tablets that this was a spaceport, okay, all the way in the deep past. So what does the scripture say? Zechariah, and that, I'm not talking about Zechariah Sitchin, this is the book of Zechariah, uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 3, says that in that day, the Lord says, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the people, for all the nations of the world. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut into pieces through all the people of the earth will be gathered together against it. That is the end time war. Okay. And the battle of Armageddon, the word Armageddon comes from the Hebrew Har Megiddo, which means mount of field of blood, which is outside of the, the city gates of Jerusalem. And this was an ancient battlefield that they would all meet and, and, you know, fight, you know, guerrilla warfare type fighting. Yep. And, um, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, it's horrible, but it's it's a it's a connection to this prophecy that Hamas burned uh, that f that field um, on on October seventh and eighth when when they were you know going mm -hmm. on a rampage and and the field and, and uh, the fields of Armageddon were just burned to a crisp. So nobody was really there. They just burnt the land. So whatever they were doing is is right in line with all of these prophecies, who they are, who they represent, who has uh, funded them, which is Iran, okay, and Hezbollah, H Hamas, uh, Hezbollah, Daesh, uh, ISIS, uh, they, they're all, uh, uh, these terrorist organizations, jihadist organizations that have been funded by Iran. And so the end time World War III, is, according to Ezekiel 38, and 39, the final battle is Armageddon, but that happens after World War III. That is like the, the, the final battle. But World War III happens first, okay? And what it says is that a coming prince that comes out of the revived Roman Empire, all right? And, you know, the Antichrist has multiple names throughout the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. So in the New Testament, he's called the son of perdition, the man of sin. Um, but he is this person, okay, this, this man that also says that he will hold no affection for women. So, so people interpret that, that maybe he's a homosexual or maybe he, he just, you know, is against women. Okay. And Islam is, you know, pretty, pretty anti women. Pretty anti when they see women as as uh, at, sex at least at least the the hardcore sects of it yes absolutely orthodox yes yeah. the the jihad so yes. this is that so somehow they're all pulled together um, all these nations so uh, the 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 scriptures talk about who they are I have identified them in their modern names some of them are the same but. Um, so like, um, Meshech, okay, so a lot of Christians get confused with the Gog and Magog references in Ezekiel 38 yes. and 39 and also in Revelation 20. So in Ezekiel's prophecy, it talks about Gog will be the leader of a great army that attacks the land of Israel. Okay. And the land of Magog, so Magog is a land which a lot of historians believe was these ancient lands of Turkey, which today we would call Turkey, um, and even bordering where there is um, uh, Russia, parts of what today is now called Russia, yep. um, and also... Um, so uh, there, there is also, let me just uh, get this. Okay, so Phoenicia is Lebanon. Zarephath, Sarafand is also part of Lebanon today. Um, Sardis is Turkey. The Negev is Judea, which is in Israel. 
Um, that's where I went to school in the Negev. That is still part of Israel. Um, when I was going to school in Israel, the Sinai actually belonged to Israel, and then they gave it to, to Egypt. So the, the land that that uh, God gave to the Jews was like a hundred times bigger than it is today. So it's been cut up so many times and they're still fighting over these little places. So now what just happened with Gaza is all part of the prophecy from Obadiah, which is against the Palestinian, uh, against Edom. It was ancient Edom. And uh, Esau, the mountains of Esau, which are the Palestinian West Banks. And uh, basically the prophecy talks about the Lord himself is going to be the king of that kingdom when he returns. Um, but but the surrounding nations are these Islamic nations that that we go into Ezekiel 38 talks about how they come against Israel. So um, so Meshech, uh, Rosh, Meshech and Tubal, a lot of Christians think Rosh is Russia, but Rosh in Hebrew means head. Um, Rosh means like like a president or a governor or a leader. And back in those days, they didn't call it Russia. In fact, we, we only started calling it Russia recently in our lifetime. When I was born, it was the Soviet Union. So there were other names for that land. Um, but the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, um, it, you know, they think that that's modern Russia, but those words, Meshach and Tubal, were actually in the land that we call today Turkey. Now, what has happened recently over the past two decades is that Turkey has gone from being a secular nation to now an Islamic nation. So Tur Turkey was such a cool place to go. Even the Israelis used to go vacation there. Now it's being run by uh, clerics and radical Islam. And um, um, what's his name? The the Turkish uh, guy um, Erdogan. Erdogan. He, er, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Erdogan. He he wants to uh, make it an Islamic state, like a theocracy. That's his goal. And and his other goal is to lead all the Islamic nations. Like he wants to be the head of all is of, of Islam. So you're talking about all these other uh, countries, which we call the stands. Okay. So you've got, you know, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, you know, all these stands that are also, I mean, the Taliban is uh, associated with Afghanistan, but they're all, you know, radical Muslim nations, radical Islam is what they practice. So he, in the end times, this is what it says, is that there is going to be a coalition. Like they all come together. There's like 10 heads under the same one uh, head or dragon. And that's where the word Rosh comes from, the head. So even in Hebrew, they call like uh, Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year or Rosh yeah. Hamemshala is the word they use for prime minister, mm. who is the head of the government. So that's why I'm saying that Rosh is not Russia, but it's Meshek and Tubal, which are which is Turkey. And again, it falls fits into the theme of the coalition of Islam. Sure. So and then. Um, and I'm also questioning this. I don't know. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it, they're words that, that appear in the Old Testament multiple times, as well as in the book of Revelation is Gog and Megas. Who is Gog? Okay. Gog sounds like a giant. Don't, don't you, I mean, like, you know, if you were like watching a movie, like, and, and, you know, here comes this 30 foot, you know, giant being. I mean, wouldn't Gog be a good name for him? Sure. <laughs> so there is no reference, okay, that says that it's that it's a person. But I am saying that because of the supernatural power of this being named Gog, that that it it it, it, it it's part of the beast. It's part of the Antichrist uh, army that it, that 
that rises up in the end times and they all go against Israel. So what is the thing with Israel? So it's Jerusalem. It's this ancient space. Post. So let me let me just tell you, go back to a little history here. So um, Babylon took Jerusalem 2,600 years ago. Then Persia, which is today's Iran, took Jerusalem 2,500 years ago. Then Greece took Jerusalem 2,200 years ago. And then Rome took Jerusalem 2,100 years ago. And then the Muslims took Jerusalem 1,300 years ago. And then the Ottoman Turks, they took Jerusalem 500 years ago. And then the British, they took Jerusalem from the Turks a little over 90 years ago. And then just over 40 short years ago, God allowed Israel to once again have Jerusalem as their own capital. So this is what they're fighting over. And and this statement, which is, you know, public uh, from Iran, has, has said that they are going to use jihad to liberate Jerusalem from Israel, from Israeli control. And, um, and they're not going to stop until they do. So that is the the battle lines of world war three and uh all the you know as anyone who studies history and uh who studies world wars world war one was is connected the same themes uh were repeated in in one way or another uh to world war two and then of course world war two was the jewish holocaust but Anti said the anti Semitic rhetoric and all of the tropes and everything that everyone's been dealing with started yeah. at World War One. Um, and that's why Hitler came into power because because they were so flattened. The Germans were like, you know, yeah, just help us. Help well, us. They get were they us. were reaching for a national identity again. And yes. I've I've said it on the show numerous times. We are scarily, scarily right at that point. I mean no, yes, it's no different banning books than burning them, folks. Hate to tell yes. you, you're you're uh, it's still thought policing. You're still keeping people from knowledge. Exactly, Chris. No and that's why this war that is happening now in Israel is really the beginning of it's 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 our war to defend our freedoms. Okay, our freedom of religion, our freedom of of speech, our freedom to be who we are, uh, uh, freedom of e uh, equality between the sexes, the genders, um, and that's why whatever is going on in Israel is 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 going to be felt all around the world, and if it hasn't already, and people here, I mean, it's like people are saying that oh, that's like Israel's nine eleven. What we went through here on 9-11, it's very, it, there's a lot of similarities, but what people are now waking up to after these atrocities that, you know, we've been seeing that has happened since October 7th is that this could easily, like anybody who think it can easily happen here in the mainland Absolutely. of the United States of America. And for anyone to think otherwise, I mean, they are trafficking people across our southern border. OK, and some of them are actually coming in from the Middle East. So so they are establishing it's like what is an old saying, like the ca the camel's nose under the tent. OK, which means that they come in and, you know, great invasions happen in secret. Like like everyone is, is saying, oh, there's going to be an alien invasion. Well, you know, the aliens are already here. All right. They they've they've been here a long time. That's why we call it the alien presence, because they live inside the planet. So so they're not coming from out of space to land on Earth. They're already here. And the same thing yeah. here in America. They're this this uh, they're setting the stage for World War Three. I will show a statistic that I bring up on the show all the time. And somebody recently called me on it. They're like, that can't be. It is, folks. I am here to tell you we are more ready to kill ourselves in America and to have a civil war than we are to fight a world war. 
That's chilling. The number of people killed in the American Civil War is literally more than the number of people of Vietnam, World War One, and World War Two combined. Wow. Combined. We are more ready to go brother against brother, family against family, neighbor against neighbor than we are to carry it on across the globe, Ella. And that's frightening. That is, a, like you said, that is a chilling number to yeah. see in front of your face. That is a chilling number yeah. to know that we killed more brother on brother than we did other people doing something to us. Um, yeah. And that's a mentality that has not left us. Yes. Because of poli I don't care who you vote for. I, I will have Christmas at your house. I will come have Yom Kippur at your house. Like, I don't care. I don't yeah. care. But for some reason, we have gotten back to a point where if you vote for something that I don't like, like, we may as well put a wired fence between our lawns, you know, like, like it's frightening. It's frightening. It is, it is frightening. And you, you can't just disagree agreeably anymore. Yeah. Where we used to have this, where we embrace that, that was our freedom of speech and, and our individuality. And the fact that we were many parts like a tapestry that made up a whole, everyone is disconnected. And why is that? So my new book, that I just published in, in August, which is I republished book one as awesome. a fourth, an expanded uh, fourth edition. I added 20 extra chapters and expanded it into a seven by 10 to fit everything in because and, and and all the old stuff is in there about the A to Z of who the ETs mm -hmm. and the aliens are. But this was something that 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 just kind of like hit me really strong because of what you just said. And there's a Machiavellian alien agenda at play. Um, you know, you, you know me, I'm, I'm about discernment. I don't, I'm not one of these uh, like, Oh, all, all is yeah. this and all is that. And like Christians, I stand in the middle between Christians and, and new agers where Christians, Oh, all aliens are demons. No, all demons are aliens, but not all aliens are demons. And they only have half of the story. And the reason that they only have half the story is because of these doctrines of anti-Semitism. They basically kept a hundred Jewish ancient texts away from them and that has the rest of the story in it about yeah. uh, the extraterrestrials it, and it's in the bible today the extraterrestrials are in biblical prophecy it's still right? in there it's still in there there's still a lot there and and the, what's crazy is that there there was plenty of editing done after the Can council of nicaea that's just where the final version like okay yes um, after that, like, geez, Martin Luther and 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 the good king had a great time taking out Tobit and Bell and the Dragon and all yeah. sorts of other apocrypha. Um, but yes, absolutely. The the first and uh, there there are probably many Catholics I know right now that are like, Chris, where were you a while ago? Um, right there with the truth, folks, is where <laughs> I am. As much as I hate to say it, like, sorry, Jesus was much more of a Virgo like me than he was born in December. Feel free to look at the actual, like, star that was followed and where it was at the approximate time. Even the yeah. fact that we aren't even on the same calendar as mm -hmm. an unbroken civilization. Mm -hmm. Like, Judaism's on a totally different calendar than the rest of the world. Totally different. This is true. And even, even their calendar had to be adjusted multiple yeah. times because they keep messing with things. That's why I don't like making calendar predictions, but you guys yes. can tell you like, oh, this is where we're at and what's going to happen next, what's going well, to unfold. And, and there's those things that are in there that the that the prophets say, the quote, signs of the times. Signs you know? of the times. And, and, and the thing is, and this is what I always tell people, this is one reason why I have not done a show on Nostradamus. I, I would be interested if you know a Nostradamus researcher, Ella, feel free to get him at me. I would love to do a show on Nostradamus, but I cannot call him a prophet. Mm -hmm. I can't call him a prophet because there's no way out. And with proper prophecy, there is always a chance of redemption. There is always a way out. 
There's Rhythms. there's always a way to backpedal. There is always a way to put the to pump the brakes and stop things. Well, and that's know. kind of what the signs of the times are about is to be like, hey, forget a warning flag. Here's a flare. Boom. You know, you're, um, you're right, because all of the prophets had one thing in common. It was a common denominator that they all said, including Jesus himself. Repent. Yeah. And that's how you change. That's how you time travel. That's how you change your past. That's how you change your future. And that is what we have the power to do. We have the we can make that decision and we can change everything yep. uh, in our own uh, timeline. So so you're absolutely right. That is what is within all these prophecies. But but why do these prophecies seem to unfold and come true as they're spoken is because people are are, you know, We're people. Like, recalcitrant and and they don't want to repent and everybody's we are a sadly them. sadly predictable animal yeah Ella, and, and, in and our behaviors how, spiritually yeah. m humanly and that's how the aliens are able to manipulate us that's why i call it an a machiavellian alien agenda because they mm. it is Machiavellian has to do with the policies of dividing and conquering. Yeah. And this is old. This is ancient. And, and it's worked time and time again. And if they can keep us from uh, uh, realizing our true power, which is in unity, we are powerful when we come together. I mean, look at what happened in That's the right. past. Whenever we all coalesced and we all came together and forget our little petty differences, we, we moved mountains. We got somewhere. The same thing in Israel. When you, when you, like everyone in Israel right now is all on, like they're all together because they're all fighting to preserve Israel. And this is what has all these wars have always brought people together. 9-11 brought a lot of us together. I mean, and then everything fell apart again. But, you know, these types of things have opportunities in them. So they know, the aliens know, the the, the powers. The, we, we war not against flesh and blood. We war against powers, principalities, rules of the darkness of this present world, and spiritual wickedness in the heavens, which are the aliens. The powers, the archons that rule this planet, they benefit from our division they benefit from yeah. our strife and the wars because what happened from our fear and the fear and the shock and the awe is that our energy this is the louche this is the louche the soul energy that gets emitted when everyone is is shocked terrorized hurt going in pain sorrow all of the misery that 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 division and war and conflict happens whether it's you know political um differences that you know we talked about that people can't even talk to each other families don't talk to each other people unfriend they unblock i mean that's minor compared to you know being beheaded and burned alive and tortured and all these horrible things that that the muslims are doing that are creating even more of this like uh loose energy because now everyone is suffering okay yeah. so so someone is benefiting from that and who that is in in my opinion and what i've sort of identified is this alien pre these are the negative aliens that are holding on to their power this is what the bible calls the god of this world and it is in their they are the ones that start these or they are creating that's why the lord had these prophecies written so accurately because he knows who they are because they're they're they come at they're they're coming against him so i want to i want to say this is very important piece because there's all this you know Please. what happened in Israel has has opened up another can of worms of anti-Semitism and not that it wasn't there because the anti-Semitism has has grown back to where it was in World War uh, II pro, uh, uh, levels because of how this is a there is um, an there is an open anti-Semitic vibe. Yes, but it's being taught in what 
has been called hate space hate spaces which are these college campuses around the country uh university of berkeley california uh, uh university of colorado and in, in boulder i mean there's a whole list of them okay that are teaching this pro-palestinian anti-israel rhetoric that is basically churning out these students to to hate that's why it's called hate spaces. This has been going on for almost two decades now. So we have, uh, you know, the culture has now come back to where it was around World War II uh, levels of anti-Semitism. So now you have the jihads that are like clearly anti-Semitic. I mean, they hate Israel. They chant. This is not a conspiracy theories. This is facts. The, the, on October 7th, when Hamas was attacking uh, Israel, the, the I, Iranian parliament put, put they, they were chanting death to Israel and death to America. They put us together, okay, because America backs Israel and, and Israel is our uh, ally in the Middle East, and America has national security interests in Israel. It, 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 the, the partnership is deep, and the partnership goes way back. And it says in uh, the book of Revelation that when all the nations of the world go against Israel, there is only one, and, 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 and nobody is left to defend them except an eagle. And some people think that is us. Okay, because we're represented by the eagle. But basically, what I wanted to say is that it's the Lord. So it's the Lord saves yeah. Israel. Okay, and it says here that he lets all this stuff happen be because he is making a statement and that he is one, that he is the Lord, that he is the king, and that he is true to his covenant. And even if they've broken their covenant to him, he's keeping their his covenant to them. So whenever he, this is why all these wars that they have fought since 1948 is against all odds. It's always against all odds. They're always outnumbered in some one way or another. And it's always the Lord that somehow turns something around and they end up winning mm. and it's not because israel is so righteous okay because they're not because there's a whole lot of you know secularism in israel they, they got Hate they got a, a whole a whole peck of problems of their own going on when it comes to you know that's right. internally and they're yeah. not even all on the same page except yeah. during wartime e equal everybody. rights all kinds of things yes and the religious right there's there's absolutely a, big movement for the rabbis to take over. And this is what you started uh, the show with, with the third temple. So that's how that's going to happen because they're already ready. They have everything they need financially, materially in place to rebuild this third temple. And this, so there's three reasons, okay, politically why uh, um, Iran used Hamas to attack Israel. Okay, obviously the Palestinians are have been used as pawns in this war against Israel for the longest time. So they're they're victims and there they're also pawns. Yes, from Texas to Israel, red heifers needed for the temple to arrive. That because that's part of the prophecy. Uh -huh. They need red heifers. So they're all ready. The only thing, and then this this other piece happened which was um, this alliance, the Abraham Accord, between Saudi Arabia and Israel, which was unprecedented. And that happened like two weeks ago before the uh, attack happened. And who is the arch enemy of the Saudis? Iran. Iran and Saudi yeah. Arabia are, are enemies. And get this, it says in... The uh, Old Testament prophecy that in that day, Persia is going to destroy Arabia by fire. So Saudi Arabia is ancient Arabia. The only reason it's called Saudi Arabia is because of the royal Saudi, the mm -hmm. Saudi. And now it's called, but it's still Arabia. It's still, you know, the biblical Arabia and Persia is today's Iran. So that's the scripture. It's going to destroy that, that Persia will destroy Arabia, will destroy Mecca. It says even specifically Mecca because that's where they go for their pilgrimages yes. 
by fire. So that connotes a nuke, okay, by fire, right? So, mm. um, so this is a, a, a ancient stuff between them. All right. And so when they saw that, that the Saudis and the Israelis got into the Abraham Accord, they didn't like that. And that's all also part of this attack. I read, uh, and I can't confirm or deny the um, authenticity of it, but I'll just tell it to you because everyone is like, oh, you know, how come, how come the Mossad didn't see this coming? How come Israeli intelligence failed? Why didn't they say this, this was obviously planned? Uh, you know, it was a whole elaborate thing. The Egyptians said that they that they received intelligence that this attack was was coming down the pike four weeks before it happened four to six weeks before it happened and they informed uh the, the israeli government and apparently they were ignored so it's very similar to what happened to us in 9 11 mm -hmm. where you know, uh, uh, President Bush was given intelligence in August about this, and they didn't do anything about it, and then it happened. So, I, I you know, there's going to be a lot of coulda, shoulda, woulda. You know, if anyone has seen, and I just did recently um, on Rosh Hashanah, believe it or not, uh, the movie Golda, which is played mm. by Helen Mirren, which is basically Israel's uh, taking Israel's story, like from is from from Israel's point of view, on the Yom Kippur War of 1973, which is what they're comparing this to, and how they didn't see it coming, and the decisions that were made or not made, and and all the mistakes and how they backpedaled it all. It's very very similar. So history repeats itself in many ways. One of the 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 main messages here that is that is again a common denominator in all of these attacks on Israel is how the Lord saves them nobody is is on their side except him and he comes like at the 11th hour and saves them because he wants them to 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 see that he is the king of Israel, that he is their God and their Lord. And a lot of them have sort of like, you know, like it's split. The religious right, yes, they believe in God, but they're so like religious that they can't even see straight. You know what I mean? Like everything is yeah. legalism and it's that religious spirit that that caused uh, Yeshua to be crucified. But the, the, the they do find and a lot of people think, oh, that Israel has has abandoned God. And that's not true because uh, uh, most Israelis believe in God. However, there's a, a, a half of them are, are secular. OK, and this is, again, another piece of the end time prophecy. So one part has already come true, and that is the Ezekiel 3, where the Lord brings uh, ancient Israel, brings the Jews back to the their own land. It says so in Ezekiel 37. So they're back in their own land, and I think now there's probably 9, 10 million, uh, something like that. But the second part of the prophecy is also we're starting to see unfold, and that is when Israel, when Jerusalem acknowledges who he is and says that he's not coming back until they do this. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so when I was living there in 1976 to like 1982, like they didn't even have New Testaments in Israel. There was no, you couldn't find one in a library or a, uh, a bookstore. Now they're allowed New Testaments in Hebrew so Israelis can read New Testaments. I, I know a handful of people. Mm -hmm, I know a handful of people here in Colorado that were kicked out of Israel. They're Jewish. They're Messianic Jews like me. They believe, you know, that that Yeshua was the Messiah, and they they were kicked out of Israel for for talking about it. Okay, now they have organizations like OneForIsrael.org, mm -hmm. which is Messianic Israelis, and during the pandemic they grew because people had nothing better to do than sit and watch videos and they put all these videos out and and now so the numbers and the numbers are not always accurate because there are people that don't actually report so you have to kind of have that um margin of error 50,000 
Jews living in Israel believe in Yeshua. Okay. Wow. And maybe even like a hundred uh, thousand worldwide or something to that effect. And that's the last time I checked Jews for Jesus. They kind of keep track of these things, but it's, it's hard to get it because there's so many people in Israel that do believe, but they do, they keep it to themselves because they don't want the, uh, you know, to be uh, mocked or excommunicated like, yeah. like I was from their Jewish family. So, so this is a very big piece of end time prophecy because the 144,000, which are the 12,000 from each of the 12, Yep. Less tribes of Israel. So there's one tribe that got cursed, yep. and that's the tribe of Dan. So Joseph had the double portion. So Joseph gave it to his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And a lot of us believe that Ephraim and Manasseh ended up in England and America. Okay? So we... Yep. We are, we are from, because they had the double portion, they had the extra land. So, so it is, it is, the, it is God's will to bring 12,000 from each tribe to the land of Israel. And this is not just on the planet, but back to Israel, okay, to be representatives of him during these end times. Okay, so that's all that's needed is a remnant. It does the whole entire state of Israel doesn't need to all oh, everyone has to believe the same thing. There's got to be a remnant. And that's how he's worked in the past. But his whole thing, the common denominator of all these prophecies is that yeah. he saves Israel, not because Israel is righteous in the, in and of themselves, but because God is, because God is going to show them and the world that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is the king, and he keeps his word, and he keeps his covenant despite the fact that they haven't. So I'm saying this because I see all this, you know, all these anti-Semitic tropes online about, oh, well, they're being punished. You know, it's like we Jews have been punished like we, we can write the book on punishment, okay? Like punish beyond belief, okay? Enough with the punishment. We are under grace, okay? That is the new covenant. And if people want to keep the, the old law, it says so. If 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 you keep you're gonna follow the old law, it says so in the the end of the book of Leviticus, that there's like six hundred and thirty-five laws. And if you want to keep the old law, that means you have to keep it perfectly. And if you break one, you're you're guilty of breaking them all, which is the reason why Yeshua came, okay, to to basically uh give give the, the new covenant of grace that we are under the grace of God, all right, which is which is a supernatural thing, which is not something that we can do. And this is this is where God gets the glory, and He gets uh, He gets the credit for this. He gets the credit for salvation. People are not saved because they're perfect, or they follow this religion perfectly, or they know Scripture yeah. perfectly, or any of that stuff. That's all like you know outward stuff. That's religious spirit stuff. We we are saved because yeah. of the grace of God, and we accept it. You know, I mean, not everybody's accepted it. So it's almost like um, like like having a credit card, you know, when you have all this credit and you've never activated it. So um, th this is what the, the and, and it's easy. It, it's not rocket science. You, you don't need to be, uh, you know, go to yeshiva and all of this. You just need to accept what he did to bring it all to, to bring because it's his unique role as in, in Hebrew. He's called the Moshiach Nagid, which means the Messiah King. So it's his unique role to bring everyone together. Okay, so that is who he is, and that's what he's going to do when he returns. However, this is where it gets complicated for all of us, and this is where the dis discernment is, is very much needed. And that is before he comes, we will have a counterfeit Messiah who will attempt to do those very things. They will, he will attempt to unify the world through a one world order, a one world religion, a one world government, and a one world currency. And he will control who can buy or sell or be in that economy. All right. And if you don't do things his way, he will behead. That's what the Bible says. That's the prophecy. And that's why Whoever this being is, okay, and we can we can talk about who, who he hasn't he hasn't um, emerged yet because he emerges on the world on the global scene, 
at the end of world, he ends World War III. So all these nations coalesce and go after Israel. And he is the one that makes a peace treaty between Israel and all of her enemies. Okay, so he is looked upon as this uh, prince of peace. He is, he, he is a peacemaker and he has supernatural power, says in Revelation 13, that he has the power to call down fire from heaven, okay, which is biblical vernacular for alien technology, mm-hmm. you know, uh, weapons, from, weapons from space, um, fire from heaven, weapons from space. So, so, but he, we don't know who he is yet, but he comes out of, I surmise, this is my hypothesis, I could be wrong, but I surmise that in order, because it says that Israel accepts him as the Messiah, which is, they, they, and he gets the temple built. He's the one who, who gets this temple built. He sits in the temple and he declares himself God. Okay. And Israel thinks that he's, he, he must be their Messiah. So they get tricked. They get deceived. This is what this whole seven year, and it's a seven year tribulation. That's what the book of Daniel t- uh, tells us that it's yeah. seven years and, and everything changes halfway into it. Three and a half years. He starts off as one thing and then three and a half years into it, all hell breaks loose. And it's the worst persecution that has ever happened in, in, in the history and even worse than Hitler. So, so, you know, he has all these different names and, and Daniel calls him a coming prince. So this is interesting because when you start delineating and discerning and like picking apart who these beings are. So let's go back to that, um, you know, that story about the, uh, Michael, Archangel Michael, mm. Archangel Gabriel and Daniel and the Prince of Persia. So there's this whole drama and dynamic that goes on. And, and, uh, you know, you know, the story about Daniel in the lion's den and, and, you know, yeah. he, he had to, God proved that Daniel was with God. And so the king saw that he didn't get eaten. And, you know, and so Gabriel was the angel who had to deliver a message to Daniel, but he couldn't get through because the prince of Persia, it says, was blocking him. So he had to go, this is very a little bureaucratic in a way, he had to go to Michael, Archangel Michael, who was put in charge as the guardian of Israel. That's his uh, um, uh, initial official role. That's what it says in the ancient scriptures. Who he is today to New Agers is a whole different Michael. Okay. But the ancient yeah. Archangel Michael was put in charge of protecting Israel. Okay, so he had to go to Michael and get Michael to push back the prince of Persia so that Gabriel could deliver this message to Daniel. I mean, it's right there. This is what it this is what it says. So we see that there is some kind, you know, this is where people go, well, you know, why aren't my prayers getting heard or answered? It's like a hard heaven. There's a, there's a, uh, you must have heard that term, hard heaven, like you, mm. you're hitting something and you're not getting through. And that's because there are these uh, archons, princes, principalities, and princes are another word for like arc. So there's seven, ar- there's seven archangels and there's seven arch demons, and they're all princes. So when Daniel talks about this coming prince that is going to uh, to basically rule for seven years. He only gets seven years one week, okay? Because there's, there's, there's a whole thing with the timing, and it's very precise. And so far, it's been very accurate. We just haven't arrived to that final week yet, mm. which begin the seven-year tribulation. So the seven-year tribulation is also known as the time of Jacob's troubles. So Jacob, as you know, became Israel. So this is this is the trouble over Israel, which is why 
um, you know, Zechariah says that Jerusalem is going to be this burdensome stone for the nations because the whole world is going to get sucked into this final battle there. Mm. So, so, so what happens with this coming prince who is the Antichrist? He, he's very eloquent. He, 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 everybody falls in love with him. He, he, he brings peace to this war that no one, and he's the only one that does this because everyone has tried and has failed. And it's one of our American politicians, you know, goals is, oh, uh, we're going to make peace in the Middle East. We're going to bring peace between mm. Israel yeah. and Palestine, and nobody's able to do it. But this man does it, okay? And everyone worships him because he finally brings peace to this ancient war. And everyone is just like, oh, and then they have this time of what the Bible calls a false peace, where uh, Israel feels like, oh, now they're safe and they're secure and, and everything is going well until all hell breaks loose. And who this being is, well, you know, based on what it says, who he's going to be, where he's going to come out of, and how Israel is going to accept him, first of all, I can tell you flat out that Israel would never accept someone that they will say is their Messiah unless he had Jewish blood, okay? Mm -hmm. Because for years, yeah. you couldn't even get in. The law of return, which is the law of Aliyah, meaning, you know, like anyone who's Jewish on the planet is welcome to immigrate to Israel, as long as you're Jewish, okay? And then, you know, people convert to, and they have to show their conversion papers, they're allowed into, which is the reason why the Messianic, uh, the J Jewish Christians got kicked out because they don't want, they, they're, they're offended by Christianity. And, and, you know, if you look at history, you understand why, because of, you know, the Inquisitions, the pogroms, the Holocaust, you know, all of this. It's got a couple of reasons. A couple of reasons, all sort of orchestrated and funded and put forth by Christians. So that's why yeah. Israel is, is a little shaky. With, so this is why it's like so um, radical for Jews to accept Yeshua in Israel. So when you have this 144,000 that is going to be living in the land of Israel representing Yeshua, that is when all this starts to happen because then God will have a, the Lord will have achieved his remnant and that would be considered the 144,000 is the remnant. Mm. And they are used in, you know, the events that 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 take place. So the temple is a major marker of uh, the seven year tribulation yeah. because, and get this, so get this. So here's another piece. Okay. Which, which is where deception and, you know, counterfeiting come in. So right now this is happening. This has been happening since 2013 is that the, um, Jews in Israel are chomping at the bit to build this, that they can't build the temple. So they're reinstating animal sacrifices. Yep. So on Passover every year, somebody goes up, to that temple mount and basically slaughters a goat or a sheep. So just the other, just recently, because we just had uh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, so because somebody tried to sacrifice a sheep and they got, uh, this was before the Hamas attack, and they got arrested by Israeli security. Another reason that the um, jihad, jihadists, the Muslims, do not are attacking because they don't want to give up this um, stronghold that they have on the Temple Mount, which is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Okay, so back in the uh, what is it, 1980s, I guess, when I started really getting into all of this stuff and questioning, like, how is this going to happen? Like, I was really into the prophecies, and I kept asking, well, God, how is that ever going to happen? Because I lived in Israel. I went up to, I visited there, I don't know, multiple times. And security is very tight. And they, they do, they, they have very, you know, like um, definitive boundaries. They do not want Jews. There's all kinds of problems there. The only way is something supernatural that is going to come about that is going to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque. 
okay, either like an earthquake, which is something that is supernatural, right? Like it's not like an attack or something happens that is going to cause them to build. And here's another big piece, a very big piece is that the Muslims are now wanting to be part of this third temple. So there, there is ongoing negotiations between the Muslims and the Temple Institute in Jerusalem to build this third temple as long as the Muslims can be part of it. So don't you think that that's uh, an interesting piece that pulls in this end time prophecy? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, once again, it is it is thick. It is it is a hard topic to talk about. It is a hard topic to digest. And especially whenever you start looking at what is happening and what's going on, um, it, it makes it really hard. Uh, but it's something that we do have to consider and something that we do have to talk about um, when when looking at motivations of people, when looking at why people are doing things that they are. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I want to thank you for the time on this. It has been more than in depth talking about all of it and going through what is an amazing breakdown that you put together, Ella, truly. Um, oh, thank you. There was just one thing I, I, oh, I, absolutely. I, I please. Myself. I just wanted yeah. to say that one other piece is what the, uh, the Antichrist does. So they reinstate the, the sac the, the animal sacrifices, which they've already been doing without the temple. They're going to do that in the temple and he stops it. It says in the, in Daniel that he puts an end to these animal sacrifices because he gets all this pushback from all these people who are already pushing back on animal sacrifices, like, you know, PETA and, and yeah. all these animal rights groups, which in Israel is, is, you know, they're growing there. People just don't want that. Yeah. So he stops the animal sacrifices. So that is the beginning of, of that uh, halfway point, And then all hell breaks loose because he feels like he wants to be worshipped. They don't need to sacrifice the blood of animals. And really, if anyone who believes in Yeshua and what Yeshua did for all of us, no animal or human can uh, outdo his blood yeah. sacrifice. It's done. It's, that's it. It cannot be, you know, and which is where. It the, would the, be the, interesting, the, though, if. if come the point of sacrifice of the heifers that yeah. that, is, that that is for gone mm -hmm. in such a way uh so that is that is something to keep your eye out for folks because once again yes uh for the building of the new temple there are there is supposed to be a sacrifice of red heifers for that to happen so it would it would be interesting to see if because Talks are happening as we speak about the building of the new temple. Yes. Um, it, it, it'll be interesting to see if that comes to bear as the case. Um, yes. It's very current. It's in their minds all the time. And that they're, it's in the news even, you yeah. know, like they're even talking about it on CBN. Yep. Christian Broadcasting Network. And um, they're helping. They want to help them. So there is a Christian... Um, Alliance with Israel, Kufi, Christian United for Israel, and they uh, they have what they call protexia, which is like a Israeli term in the Israeli government because they are considered Christian Zionists, but mm. they don't proselytize Jews, which is why the Israeli government favors them because uh, they they give them a lot of support you know, uh, spiritual, political, yeah. and financial. So just putting that out there in case anybody's wondering. Yeah, man, it is once again an incredible topic and something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. I'm glad that I got to speak with you about it, Ella. Well, thank um, you. Thanks it, for... It's, well, it, it, to me, once again, it's important to not only look at the Christian tradition of it, but to look at the Jewish tradition of it and to look at the Jewish roots of it to begin with. Um, because if we don't understand that, then we are looking at nothing but a game of telephone and a full-on misinterpretation of something. 
So thank you very much for being able to help us hack our way through the jungle on that and and get into it. Uh, Where can everybody go to keep up with everything that is Ella LeBain to go to go get their new version of who's who in the cosmic zoo, the updated new edition. Oh, well, thanks, Chris. Um, yes, uh, you can go to my website, um, who's who in the cosmic zoo.com. And I sh- do free shipping to anyone with a United States address. Otherwise I also uh, sell the PDF version and I'm on Amazon, uh, pretty much worldwide. Um, Except in the Muslim countries, <laughs> so you can get you can catch Not me by your own doing. Yeah, well, I just don't feel like I should be marketing there. Yeah. So, but uh, I'm yeah. in Europe and Australia, Canada. So you know, um, Israel yeah. too. So fantastic, fantastic. Thanks. Well, once again, as always, thank you so much, Ella. It's always great to talk with you. Uh, Your topics are vast and deep, and I cannot wait to talk with you in our next visit about alien species and the different species that are out there, what they do, why they are doing it. Um, So hold the line real quick while we close things out with the audience, Ella. Uh, While you are online checking out all of the amazing work of Ella LeBain over at Who's Who in the Cosmic Zoo dot com. Stop on by CuriousRealm.com. That is where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can lock, like, follow, subscribe, share, all of that good stuff. We are on just about every platform you can find, folks. Uh, that's also where you can find the store where you can purchase not only Ella's books, but all of the books from our guests, uh, our friends, everything else. Uh, thank you so much, as always, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you so much for your open minds, open hearts. That is what changes the world around us. Until next time, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and remember, stay curious. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning into this episode of The Curious Realm. Stay tuned for more guests, forbidden topics, and hidden truths. Download the official Curious Realm app and view the Knowledge Vault on our website, CuriousRealm.com. Follow us on social media by searching Curious Realm. Curious Realm is available on your favorite podcast services, as well as YouTube, Roku, Amazon Fire, and Apple TV through the APR TV app, available on all app markets. Curious Realm is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great content or to become a sponsor of Curious Realm or other podcasts, visit hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Thanks for listening. Stay curious. And remember, the other side is always watching.